It was everywhere, the New York Post, a bunch of other news outlets. I literally saw it on the news. Protein causes heart disease. Closed book, done. Protein, that's it. And this comes from a study that was published in Nature. And anyone that has any scientific rigor in their life whatsoever was able to look at this study and almost laugh. I'm gonna to try to hold it together because I literally want to belly laugh when I look at some of this data. But let's break it down and I will hold it together the best that I can. So after today's video, our sponsor is Seed. I put a link down below for 25% off their daily symbiotic. So it's a probiotic and a prebiotic in one. So it has a really unique delivery system. So I am a fan of probiotics when you're making a change to like your diet or a lifestyle because it can kind of help remodel that gut microbiome to help you make that shift a little bit sooner. Now, full disclaimer, they're a sponsor on this channel. That's how this channel works. It's how we're able to create amazing content. But my promise is that I only recommend products that I personally have used or currently use. So seed down below, that is a 25% off discount link, again, for their daily symbiotic. I would probably guess that you'd notice a difference within about a week of taking it. Start noticing it digestively, you might start noticing it in other ways, but for me, I got more energy, I started sleeping better, things just seemed more regulated. So anyhow, that link down below, 25% off. So the study was published in the journal Nature, which usually publishes some decent stuff, so I'm surprised that they published this. It was a whopping 23-person study, so not very big. Okay, it had two different study arms. And what they were aiming to set out was, would extreme, quote, extreme amounts of protein be linked to heart disease? So two different study arms. One study arm consumed a, what they called more mixed food, real world scenario. And the other arm consumed an extreme protein diet, which was more liquid protein that they gave to them after an overnight fast. You want to know what they gave them? Okay, I'm going to read you a quote from the study. This was what they defined as a protein liquid meal. Varying amounts of Boost Plus from Nestle. I mean, the only people that I know that are drinking Boost Plus are people that like, need to put weight on, like need to get the calories in. That's why it's created. They also use something called injury, which I'd never heard of. Uh, soul carb, which was like a carb polymer. They used uh, canola oils, corn syrups, they used glucoses, and they were basically making a non-fat dry milk, and they were making a concoction of a liquid meal for them to consume. You can already see the problem with this, right? I really hope that you can see that Boost Plus is not the same as eating a chicken breast. Now, what they did is they made this into a concoction with either 10% protein or an extreme amount of protein at 50%. Then they drew their blood at one and three hours and they were measuring basically what's called mTOR C1. mTOR C1 is just sort of the growth signal that happens when you eat pretty much any food, but definitely happens when you eat protein. That's why protein builds muscle. Anyhow, the other study arm was supposed to be more of a real food group. So what's more real food than literally taking corn, potatoes, bacon, and some fats and putting it in a blender and liquefying it? That's about as real world as it gets. The only thing that might be different is when I get up in the morning and I put my bacon and potatoes and corn in the blender, I usually put a few Lucky Charms in too. And I also put some pixie stick dust in there because I feel like that just kind of adds some flavor so I can choke it down without vomiting. Like that is, makes no sense. That is not a real world. <laughs> anyway, point is, is they were trying to make a more real world mixed meal. And then they did the same thing. They measured their blood one and three hours later, and they saw whenever there was protein, whenever there was food in general, but more protein led to a bigger spike, bigger activation of mTOR C1 in what is called a macrophage or a monocyte. It's not super, super important to go into the details of what a macrophage or a monocyte are in this video, but essentially it was causing activation of sort of a growth signal in that case. So what does this have to do with the heart? Like we know that food activates mTOR. We know that mTOR will get activated in these particular cells. Okay, well, what the researchers did is they then said, okay, well, we're gonna look at this rodent model study from over here. This rodent model study over here, we saw 
that when rodents consumed protein and their levels of mTOR C1 went up, their levels of arterial plaque went up. So because that happened in mice, it has to be true over here in humans. So they took a small mechanistic rodent model study and applied it like one little piece of the mechanism to one little piece of the mechanism of this weird boost plus concoction study. Let's talk about the problems here in case you haven't seen them already, but I'm gonna put it together in a way that makes some more sense. First off, the small cohort of humans that had an increase in this mTOR activation that's so-called bad for the heart, there was nothing there with humans. Like we did not see anything in humans related to atherosclerosis or heart disease. All we saw was the increase in mTOR C1 and we're connecting the dots from rodent model studies. So nothing in humans here, ladies and gentlemen, nothing. Number two, even if hypothetically mTOR C1 activation in a macrophage or a monocyte was bad, how much? How much is bad? So right now we're just saying that any amount is really bad. That's sort of like saying, if you spike your glucose at all, you're diabetic. That's like saying if you sit down right now and you eat a sweet potato and your blood glucose goes up, I can safely and officially label you a diabetic. Come on, you know that's not true, right? That's essentially what we're seeing here. Or even worse, it's like saying, well, that mouse ate a potato and his blood sugar went up. So if you eat a potato, you're gonna be diabetic. That's more like what it is. Now, the correlation in mice is also interesting because that mouse study, what's interesting is there's other parts to that mouse study. That mouse study, when they increased protein, they also lost body fat and weight. They didn't mention this in this heart study. So maybe long-term, those mice actually would have done a lot better. Now, that mouse study, as far as the atherosclerosis is concerned, that was really just correlation anyway. Like, they just said, okay, when mice increased their protein X amount, their atherosclerosis, their arterial plaque, increased X amount in a linear fashion, so they drew some inference there, which is not how things work. So if we read a quote from Tom Sanders from Aston College in the UK, in London, it's pretty interesting. He says, animal models of atherosclerosis differ markedly from human atherosclerosis, which develops slowly over decades. The test meal studies were in a small number of subjects, and they only monitored plasma leucine up to three hours following the test meal. It is well known that plasma aminos return to baseline after a meal. What this means is there was nothing new learning that amino acids will spike leucine. Like why is, th okay, we've known this forever. And we know that that comes down. So in other words, like atherosclerosis develops over decades. So telling someone they're going to eat protein and acutely spike this mTOR is gonna give them heart disease. Like you're drawing something from mice, which happens very fast, because mice are very different, and connecting it to humans where it happens much slower. But let's talk protein sources, because this is flipping hilarious. Okay, remember, in the liquid meals, it was 10 to 50% protein of those, with those weird concoctions of canola oil, glucose, whatever. Okay, if 10% was protein and 50% was protein, for the love of all things good, I am scared to know what the other 90% or in the other group, 50% was. What was that made up of? Clearly, since we know what they were serving, it was a concoction of glucose syrup, corn syrup, carrageenan, soy lecithin. Oh my gosh, like these are not. So I'm gonna ask you a question, honestly, without trying to laugh. And you can put it in the comment section down below. If something was problematic or something was even causing this spike in mTOR, do you think it was like the protein or do you think it could have been the glucose syrup, the sugar, maybe the soy lecithin, maybe the carrageenan, maybe the corn syrup, maybe canola oil, how many did I list already? Do you, I don't know, which ones do you think really caused the problem? But wait a minute, there wasn't even a problem to begin with, really. Let me go ahead and bring this full circle with some better literature. First of all, we know that protein is one of the best things possible for losing weight. And that is not biased to meat. 
Animal-based, plant-based, protein is good for weight loss, good for satiety, good for overall muscle mass, which we have countless studies, countless bodies of evidence that show us that cardiometabolically protein and, or just at least reducing your fat mass is tremendously beneficial, especially when it comes down to inflammation. But let's talk protein and inflammation for just a second, because inflammation is really one of the bigger drivers if not the driver for atherosclerosis and heart disease. So the journal Nutrients had published a paper where for 10 weeks they had subjects take a straight up leucine supplement. They put them in leucine supplementation, okay, the pure amino acid that is in question in this study before, okay? And what they found, there was a 59% reduction in C-reactive protein, inflammation, in the subjects that took the leucine compared to control. So when you actually have leucine here, it's actually driving down inflammation. Well, I thought leucine was problematic. I, well, inflammation is the bigger driver here, and it seems as though having enough protein and getting leucine in actually drives inflammation down, which, hmm, I don't know there. The other thing is we have to look at is that there's bodies of literature that suggest that leucine helps with insulin signaling too. If insulin signaling is helped, then glucose levels are dropped, and that means that insulin is working in its normal function. If insulin is chronically elevated, then you have a chronic elevation of mTOR, which kind of makes sense in a lot of metabolic theories of disease too. So like what I'm saying here is, hmm, maybe protein actually helps control our glucose more, helps make it so our insulin is actually working in a typical normal fashion and not chronically elevated, which is what the real problem would be. But wait a minute, we didn't look at anything long-term anyway. We looked at a one and three hour interval after drinking a Boost Plus drink. I'll see you tomorrow.